Hello, everyone, and welcome to the FinDev Gateway webinar, What Makes a FinTech Inclusive? My name is Abby Augusta. I'm an editor for FinDev Gateway, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar. Our series of Gateway webinars allow financial inclusion practitioners like you to share lessons and attend online presentations and discussions delivered by the world's leading financial inclusion experts. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of notes on logistics. Uh, all attendees will have their microphones muted automatically. So to ask questions during the webinar, please use the chat box, which is on the right-hand side of the WebEx window. We invite you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar presentation, and we will address them in the Q&A session at the end. To make sure that your question is seen by the moderator, make sure to select all participants from the drop-down menu when you send in your question. We have over 320 people registered for this webinar, so clearly there's a lot of interest. And that means we may not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will share the panelists' contact information at the end so that you can also follow up with them if your question remains unanswered. Finally, the webinar recording and presentation will be available on the FinDev Gateway website after the webinar is finished, and we will also email the webinar recording to all participants. <clears throat> and with that, I will now hand it over to our moderator, Camilla Nestor. Thank you so much, Abby. Good morning, and thank you all for joining. I'm Camilla Nestor. CEO of MIX, the Global Data Resource for Inclusive Finance. We're very pleased to be hosting this webinar in partnership with FinDev Gateway today. There is tremendous excitement and some would say hype around the potential for financial technology or FinTech to dramatically change how poor and low-income households access, use, and benefit from financial services. The term inclusive FinTech is increasingly being used in this context, but what does this really mean? What makes a FinTech inclusive, and how can we understand this in a more standardized way so that industry stakeholders are able to identify, support, and invest in high-impact FinTech models? The goal of this webinar is to start to pull back the curtain on what makes an inclusive FinTech and share how several leading organizations are approaching this question. We'll start at the 30,000-foot level with Sarah Willis from MetLife Foundation sharing their approach to financial health and why building the fintech sector is an important component of that. Then, Michelle Karim from CDC, the UK Development Finance Institution, will share an overview of how CDC is thinking about the impact potential for fintech as part of its investment strategy. We'll then move to Mylise Carraro of BFA Catalyst Fund to share firsthand experience in selecting inclusive fintechs for Catalyst Fund and what they've learned from their portfolio of investments. And finally, we'll zoom back out to hear from Gayatri Morty at CGAP on the framework CGAP is developing to help understand impact pathways for fintech. In terms of what you can expect for the agenda, we'll hear from the speakers for about a half hour in total, and then we'll open it up to questions from participants. Before we jump in, I'd like to flag an excellent essay by CGAP CEO Greta Bull on FinTech and the poor that helps ground us in both the potential and the risks from a financial inclusion perspective. When we talk about an inclusive FinTech, this is exactly what we're trying to understand. How well does it do in reaching underserved audiences, for example, the poor or rural households or women? Or in the case of B2B FinTechs, how do they help create the infrastructure that allows for better services to these populations. To start with, I'll share a brief overview of Mix's FinTech work. We've recently launched two initiatives designed to unlock more capital for inclusive FinTech and to drive greater growth and in impact by creating more visibility and transparency into FinTech. First, we want to make it easier for funders and investors to discover quality FinTech partners and investees, especially inclusive FinTechs. Second, we're working with a group of industry stakeholders to develop common data standards and definitions that allow for benchmarking and the comparison of fintechs across segments or markets. From the fintech perspective, we want to make it easier for fintechs themselves to find investors and partners that can help them scale and reach the 3 billion financially underserved people around the world. 
These fintechs might not all be plugged into the networks that drive significant capital allocation, so visibility is crucial. Mix is excited to announce the launch earlier this week of Inclusive Fintech 50, an initiative to recognize promising early stage fintechs driving financial inclusion around the globe. The Inclusive Fintech 50 is funded by Visa and MetLife Foundation with support from Axion and IFC and will culminate in a list of impactful early stage companies that demonstrate the power of fintech to expand access, usage, and quality of financial services. The competition will assess fintechs across four criteria, inclusiveness, business model innovation, scale potential, and traction. We'd welcome your help in spreading the word, especially to fintechs who might be outside traditional networks. As we designed Inclusive Fintech 50, the team at Mix grappled with the challenge of determining the inclusiveness of a fintech. After speaking with a number of investors, donors, incubators, and other actors, we realized the need for a collective understanding of what makes a fintech inclusive. And that's what brought us here today. We've selected some of the leading organizations addressing this question to share their own frameworks for understanding inclusive fintech and their practical experience in applying them. I'm really pleased to turn it over to Sarah Willis of MetLife Foundation to start with. Great, thanks Camila, and thanks to the Mix and the Dev Gateway at CGAP for organizing this discussion. Uh, it's also great to see such a uh, robust response from the community um, listening in. Um, I work for MetLife Foundation where it's our focus um, across 40 odd countries to build financial health for all. Um, and what I'll do in the next five minutes is talk you through our framework for thinking about financial health, how FinTech helps us achieve these goals, and, and how it drives our decision making in the FinTech landscape. So the, the spectrum you see in front of you um, is, as I said, sort of what guides our investment making decision in, in grant making and financial health. On the left, you see really um, the financial basics or the simplest definition of financial inclusion, which is general, generally around access, um, which is still incredibly important in some markets with really low financial inclusion, um, but uh, for us insufficient to really achieving some of the key client outcomes that, that we care about. As you move to the right, of course, there's financial capability. That's kind of what you do, so what you know to what you do, applying these tools um, and building confidence and habits in your daily life. But moving to the third uh, quadrant, it's really our sweet spot, um, and it's what um, a low-income person uh, can achieve through the use of uh, financial services. Um, we've decided to focus on this term because we think it's important not to get stuck in a trap of um, counting transactions and, and simply uh, bank accounts and access, um, but moving to think about um, what are the transformational aspects that uh, financial services can offer to low-income people? Um, you can see the, the key client benefit is stability. Um, and why we think that's important is because for many low to moderate income people, of course, their lives are uh, marked by shocks, ups and downs, whether that's the loss of a job um, or uh, some sort of uh, disaster, a uh, medical bill, et cetera. Um, for those who are not using financial services that, that afford that stability, whether that's insurance, savings, fair price credit, um, or even thinking about the future and planning, um, it's really hard for them to manage day-to-day -day cash flows, take advantage of opportunities, and, and ultimately um, build that mobility into the financial well-being kind of um, end, end gate, uh, goal, which is really the aspirational piece of our uh, spectrum. Um, so the final word here is, you know, stability may not be sexy, um, but we think it's transformational. We think, uh, based on the research, people aspire to stability over uh, increased wealth at times, um, given how volatile uh, their lives can be. Um, so how does fintech come into play? Um, you know, we're regularly evaluating them through our competitions, accelerator models, or we're being pitched by them directly. And you know, we've observed a significant uh, amount of activity on the left-hand side of our spectrum, um, payments, remittances, basic accounts, um, and we don't mean to downplay the importance, um, but again, it tends to be very trans, trans, uh, transactional rather than transformative. Um, 
So we're ultimately interested in investing in those fintechs. Uh, whether they're out there or not is, <laughs> is a big question um, that offer those um, key client benefits of stability for low to moderate income people. Um, if you could move to the next slide. Um, we have a few, I, would, I wouldn't call this a framework, more, more of just a set of questions that our team likes to consider uh, when we're thinking about FinTech. And, you know, I'm preaching to the choir when I say we see increasing amounts of investment. Um, last year, I think, reached an all-time record in FinTech. It's an enormous opportunity um, for the financial health and inclusion field. Um, but I would also pause and acknowledge that um, you know, this FinTech and digital uh, with the increase of millions of uh, accounts opened in, in the last decade, um, where has this gotten us? And, and that's the question we ask uh, repeatedly, whether that's the case of the U.S., which is by and large included, but not financially healthy, or even Kenya, which has, you know, had a rapid increase in financial access. Um, but according to a recent Gallup survey that we funded, um, still only 11% of Kenyans are confident that they could sell or use savings to meet a financial need in the loss of income over six months. Um, so big uh, discrepancy there between financial access and uh, financial security. Um, so looking at the slide, I'll quickly preface that obviously when you're thinking about fintechs, you don't always have the information that you need. Um, and it's and it's very hard to get unless you're a direct investor. Um, so we're looking at balancing the evidence of what we know has happened so far to inform our decisions and the potential. Um, so the likelihood of or the probability of that company succeeding and really staying mission aligned as it grows. Um, so just going through those categories really briefly, um, leadership, you know, I haven't prioritized these in order necessarily, but I. I would argue this is one of the most important. Um, you know, does the founder actually have any uh, lived experience or is this based on theoretical knowledge of the problems that low income people face? Um, core business, you know, this is, it should be a core part of their offering. It shouldn't be um, on the side. Or if it's not, they should have run the financials to understand whether or not it can be in their product roadmap in the future. Um, uh, also ties to staffing and profitability. A colleague of mine likes to use the, uh, the analogy of a boutique versus a department store. So both can be profitable, but really only one reaches scale. So in the case of FinTech, you're likely not to survive if you're a boutique, um, but if you're a department store, can you scale and reach those populations that we care about? Um, so that's the target customer segment, um, low to moderate income individuals for us. Others may say underserved, unbanked, underbanked. Um, it's all uh, valid here, um, but, but is it designed according to the needs and the realities that they face in their lives? Um, and lastly, target outcome. Again, this, there's a spectrum of outcomes if you go back to my previous page, um, and, and really this is where the rubber hits the road. What is this enabling? So if it's a, a mobile phone uh, program, government switching um, to digital payments, um, where is the low income person in that story? Um, and if, if they can answer that and they've pulled the, the link through that causal chain, um, you know, that's, that's something important for us when we're thinking about fintechs and financial health. And lastly, investors, you know, who's going to influence uh, the company as they grow from C to Series A, B, and C. Um, and we, we like to see at least one impact investor, if not more, um, supporting the, the growth of the company. So I realize I'm close to time, so I think this is not a perfect uh, set of questions, and you might not find a FinTech that can say yes to all of these, <laughs> um, but we found it to be helpful in thinking through um, our own grant making um, and investment strategy. So I'll turn it back over to Camilla. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your framework. Now we're going to turn to Michelle Kareem from CDC Group. Michelle, over to you. Great. Thanks, Camilla. Um, yeah, and thank you again as well to uh, the FinDeck Group and the Mix Group for pulling this together. Um, super interesting to hear that there are quite a few people looking to think about this. Um, maybe what I'll quickly do is also just introduce, um, so as Camilla mentioned, CDC is the development finance institution for the UK government. 
We invest in South Asia as well as Africa, and we invest across three major product groups. Uh, that would be direct equity, direct debt, and an intermediated equity or fund of funds model. Um, for the entire CDC, uh, the investments in financial services or financial institutions are about a quarter of our total AUM. So that probably gives a bit of a signal on, on the importance of the sector for us and how we really look at it holistically and, and try to understand it um, from a more market development approach. Um, so that's probably what's also the slight difference in how we think about um, not only just inclusive syntax and where do they sit within the big picture, but what is our particular role in, in supporting the, the growth and development of that subsector. Um, from an uh, impact perspective, so there's two top line objectives that we have focused on, um, and one of them is building uh, inclusive financial sectors, and the other is building stronger domestic capital markets. Obviously, the former being a lot more relevant to this conversation. Um, we are very focused on when we say inclusive financial sectors, it's um, about a, a diversity of products that are available both to individuals and to firms. So um, the, what, when, we, when we refer to inclusion, we obviously mean um, you know, the, the broader spectrum of, of the stakeholders that are within the system. Uh, and we also are very keen on knowing that there's a diversity of providers. Um, because knowing that uh, each provider has uh, its own relative role to play in the provision of sustainable and scalable financial services, and um, who are the best to provide those services in their capacity given their business model, um, given their markets, and trying to make sure that those sectors, those financial sectors, are um, robust and therefore also inclusive at the same time. Um, just to kind of step back, I think I, I did mention this, but uh, just to kind of reiterate the point that when we think about um, financial sectors and, and financial sector development, we are taking a market approach. And this is particularly linked to the idea because of who we are uh, and, and what our role is in that. So absolutely that we're a DFI, uh, we have a, a, a footprint around scale, uh, the type of investor we are, the resources we have at our disposal to make those investments, the type of support we can provide to our investees uh, along the life of the investment. So with that all in mind, um, for us it's about, again, trying to build the markets uh, and influence and contribute to the building of those markets and finding out what our niche is in that space. Um, so if we, if we could move to the next slide. Great, thanks. Um, so I think just to drill down a bit, what does that mean uh, for us uh, and how we pick our investments and, and who are we looking for when we're trying to back that? Um, from, of course, you may know that you, uh, CDC is uh, kind of a double bottom line investor, to say the very least. <laughs> uh, but what we are proactively building internally is really understanding how to do a very um, a robust and effective balancing act between the commercial sustainability of something and the impact sustainability of something. And when we look for investors, oh, sorry, investees, and as an investor we look for investees, what is it that uh, about the business tells us that it can manage to do both? So um, practically what would that look like? We look to build an investment thesis. Uh, and then at the same time, we look to build an impact thesis. And those two are quite um, kind of synergistic in their relationship. Uh, we, are, we're, we openly go into the um, investment cycle making sure that they are, um, they, they're, they're both equally um, analyzed, that they, they're given equal weight in the decision process, but that they're actually feasible propositions. And a lot of people may say, or you, you know, we may hear um, from other stakeholders around this idea of understanding those trade-offs. And I think for us, it's there may be uh, some trade-offs, but I think the, the, the idea is to be quite clear about what those need to be, if at all, uh, and making sure that we can if we are driving for impact, if we are driving to achieve um, you know, a social return on our investment, it has to be uh, at the, not at the cost of the commercial return, but it has to be actually supported by the commercial business model as well. 
Um, when we focus on investments in financial services, we've decided to hone in on four big, what we're calling, barriers to impact in the financial sector. Um, these probably look familiar to basically anyone who's been working in financial inclusion, and uh, they're quite generic, and I think that's kind of the point in the sense that we are taking a more market approach. And these are very uh, reflective of, again, who we are and what we think is within our purview to influence. Um, you know, we, we all have to live within the regulatory um, environments that we, we work in, uh, and we understand that there are constraints, but we also understand that there are others that are better positioned to be alleviating those constraints than ourselves. So these are the four that actually fall out of what we think we can influence and what we can do via our investments. Um, to put it into context for the fintech space, what does that mean? Improving cost structures. Uh, I think that goes without saying. What is you know what what does the fintech uh, subsector or market actually bring to the table uh, right up front? And I think the the most exciting thing we've seen so far is its ability to disrupt. Uh, and what we mean by disrupt is not just innovate in terms of products, but actually disrupt the entire delivery chain or the value chain of how products and services are delivered from end to end. And whether that's just making it faster or whether that's just meaning that the unit economics may, are more feasible, um, it is the fact that digital financial services and fintechs have really put in a lot of um, resources and thinking into kind of taking what we know as uh, service value chains and, and turning them on their head. Um, and for us, that's interesting because if you can disrupt a cost structure, eventually and hopefully that should and could trickle down to not only the consumer, but it just makes the whole proposition uh, more uh, feasible and more commercially viable. Uh, increasing volume of capital, and I think in this area, uh, the fintechs are just, yeah, just being able to distribute more financial services deeper into markets and more people with, have more access, and it's just pure nominal terms of the capital that's available. Of course, designing relevant products, um, fintech is, is probably <laughs> the most um, ingenious at, at doing that quickly, iterative, uh, quick iterations, uh, you know, coming back and learning lessons quickly. And then the last one, managing and taking on new risk, for us is quite critical and important because one of the bigger barriers we find in the sector is that uh, new risk is generally uh, less palatable for financial service providers, and how to understand that new risk and how to cater to sub-segments of the market that may be deemed as risky and thinking that through and what that means. Um, and I think that's just the final note, I guess, I would say on all of this is that uh, when we're looking at fintechs and understanding their role in the sector as well, it's, it's not just about the retail side of the chain. It's not just about delivering the products and services, actually. And I think, um, this, you know, Camilla mentioned some of this in the beginning, it's actually also about the back-end infrastructure. Um, you know, the platforms, the switches, how do those make, uh, those investments and those companies make the market more inclusive? What are they contributing to the market so that uh, it is becoming more, over time, becoming more com commercially uh, viable to scale services? Um, and I think I think, you know, uh, as our other panelists have mentioned, that, um, you know, commercial scalability is, is basically the starting point. Uh, it has to be commercially scalable and therefore hopefully inclusive as well because you can be inclusive, but if you're not commercially scalable, then, well, I mean, it's a nice to have, but <laughs> we haven't really solved the problem by that point. Um, and I think that's probably where I'll, I'll, I'll leave off for now. I'm happy to take any questions, but again, just to recap around what FinTech means in the big sector, the role it plays, it has a very particular USP, a very particular competitive advantage relative to other service providers, other um, you know, uh, institutions in the landscape. Uh, and for us, it's to make sure that they have the space to be able to deliver that in their own right uh, with the innovative and unique business models they're bringing forward, but still holding them to account, still having the same expectations that they should be disciplined businesses, they should scale, they should grow, and they should be um, uh, commercially viable. Great. Camilla, back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. So um, before we turn it over to Malise Carraro of BFA, Catalyst Fund, I just want to remind folks to start to enter your questions into the chat box so we can get a good list going um, to turn to once we complete the speakers. 
Um, so just to, to set the stage here, we've had two really nice overviews of high-level frameworks. Going into BFA Catalyst Fund, we'll get some interesting insights from Mylise about how they are thinking about inclusive fintech in the context of their portfolio. So Mylise, over to you. Thank you, Camilla, and uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you all, and uh, I second everyone else in saying thank you for our hosts for inviting us to have this important discussion. Um, so as Camilla said, I'm going to share how our accelerator program, Catalyst Fund, evaluates how inclusive fintech startups are creating stronger value propositions for low-income consumers, and share some specific examples from our portfolio of 20 startups that really covers a myriad of services direct to consumers, but also B2B, um, and also infra infrastructure solutions. So for those who don't know us, uh, very briefly, Catalyst Fund is a global accelerator program managed by BFA and founded in 2016 by the Gates Foundation and JP Morgan Chase. Our goal is to accelerate early stage inclusive fintech startups in emerging markets and share our learnings with the ecosystem to spur more innovation for financial inclusion. So just like in forums like this one. And we really strongly believe that fintech startups hold great promise in our space because they can develop accessible solutions to people who are previously underserved. They improve the effective, effectiveness and the efficiency of uh, delivery channels and of business processes via technology, leading to reduced costs uh, and also more affordable products as a result. And they create tangible and more appropriate value propositions that can drive usage of financial services and ultimately improve financial health. But uh, not all fintech solutions are relevant and impactful in the same way for the low-income customer and for financial health more broadly. And in fact, there's a lot of hype around technologies, um, not a lot of evidence of maturity and proven strategies for what really makes fintech work for the low-income population, which is where we focus. So at Catalyst, we developed a framework that we call the AAA framework, which is essentially a blueprint uh, for designing and assessing if inclusive fintech solutions are accessible, affordable, and appropriate for the underserved. And we use this framework to assess startups at sourcing, so when they enter the program, and we do so with, in conjunction with a group of impact investors uh, that work with us. We also use it to strengthen the value proposition of the startups throughout the acceleration phase. And finally, to measure startups' progress and impact after the program. So we work with each one of them to really try to get to the proof points uh, that can give us more evidence of how each of them are really creating solutions that are AAA. Our advantage is that working directly with these 20 entrepreneurs at the early stages of their venture building really gives us deep insights into the features and strategies that make a solution AAA. So what are some of the strategies that companies use? One important strategy, for example, uh, is achieving the right mix of tech and touch. So it's very important to note that these companies often reach customers that never had access to products and services before, and that they might not be digitally savvy uh, to start off with. So the human interactions remain extremely important in the delivery of the services. And another is to create tangible and tailored value propositions for the user um, and as many of you working in this space know, uh, consumers of traditional financial services in these markets have long complained about lengthy waiting periods, hidden fees or unclear terms, confusing user interfaces. And we see that startups instead are offering speedy service, flexibility in payments, micro increments uh, of payments, combinations of services where they combine tangible offerings such as, for example, insurance and medical visits, or insurance and food coupons, and also engagement strategies that take into account customers' behaviors and preferences. So really the design of these solutions has the customer front and center, and the fact that the startups are lean and can iterate quickly allows them to develop uh, solutions that are more appropriate and tailored to them. And finally, startups are also using technology to reduce business costs, which in turn uh, can translate to lower costs for the end users, but also for ecosystem actors, like banks, for example. So there's many startups that we're seeing, particularly in the um, alternative credit scoring space, that essentially reduce the cost of lending for also traditional players. 
But um, let me give you a, a concrete case, because in this slide, you could see some of the proof points and the metrics that we were able, we able to gather to date. But I think it's best if I walk you through the case of one startup that we worked with, um, Mobilife. So Mobilife is a 100% mobile insurance company in South Africa, offering life insurance and what they call food insurance for low-income South Africans. So they are, for example, expanding access as they are targeting and reaching only low-income customers in South Africa. They have an affordable product, which is 100% delivered on mobile, and they optimize costs through a digital policy underwriting and, and policy management platform, which they actually now white label for a very large South African bank that also allow them to expand their access. And they have an appropriate solution for this demographic because they can make the value proposition more tangible by combining the insurance with food coupons for the families who lost, uh, for example, a breadwinner or a family member after the death, uh, making essentially the value of, of the insurance plus the food coupons um, much more tangible to them, um, and one could argue of higher quality uh, to answer to those needs after the death of the family member. They also, for example, allow people to skip premiums without the policy lapsing, which is a feature they call never lapse. Uh, and this is some, a problem that it's really widespread among low-income consumers in South Africa of not knowing, of having to split, to, to skip premiums because the cash flows are uneven uh, and not knowing that their policies had actually been canceled. And finally, they also combine tech and human interactions to encourage uptake during the sale process. So they leverage technology via tablets, but the sale is really guided and, and um, led by agents, and that really builds trust with the users, and we think it's a winning technique uh, that they've adopted. So you can see overall how all these features and, and strategies come together to make the service more AAA, AAA rated, as we like to, to joke, for low-income users. And this is the, the kind of proof points and practical evidence that we can gather from our portfolio companies and are trying to be methodical about so that then we can share learnings with other investors, other accelerators, and generally other players in the ecosystem and that we, so that we can expand our collective knowledge uh, of what makes FinTech inclusive uh, and create more truly inclusive FinTech solutions for the underserved. So, to conclude, I'd say we really welcome conversations like these where we can openly share the details of what we're seeing that, that works for the underserved um, and seeing key players come together in the space to, to exchange, exchange ideas. So with that, um, I'll lend it back to Camilla, but I'm happy to take questions uh, and feel free to reach out to me also after the webinar. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Melise. Um, and finally, Last but not least, we'll turn it over to Gayatri Murti from CGAP. So Gayatri, over to you. Thanks, Camilla. Um, so hi, everyone. And uh, thank you to Mix and Findel for organizing this discussion. Um, so at CGAP, we started working with fintech companies um, two years ago. And as Camilla introduced uh, us to say, our main goal was to create um, connections and pathways to impact, so between fintech companies and, and their relevance to financial inclusion. Um, as um, Greta's quote stated, um, our goal was to really draw a connection between some of this disruptive innovation and what it might mean to our problems in financial inclusion, um, whether they are solving pain points with customers um, or creating kind of market efficiencies through scale. Um, so as, as many of you may know, um, FinTech is a term that is used broadly to define tech-based innovation in financial services. And so FinTech companies or startups um, as we saw them a few years ago, were, were just one of the many players involved in fintech innovation. Um, however, our, our research showed that um, startups may be particularly wired to push boundaries in innovation and that their, their very um, DNA of being digital and being small and having an imperative to prove themselves meant that they may be more quickly able to iterate um, on, on their products than, um, than large incumbents. 
and in order to gain um, market share may may push forward with more frontier solutions so at the very kind of primer phase level we saw enough there to dig deeper um as as also you and many other panelists have mentioned that um not all fintechs may be relevant to financial inclusion and in fact as as stakeholders discussing today um i think it's very important that we quickly begin to draw those linkages um as all of you are doing um so we see that there is a cohort of companies that are beginning to emerge that offer services um that are either targeted directly to underserved segments or through their market effects resolve complex pain points um i think as we go forward in working with fintech companies it became really important to isolate whether the effects we were talking about um were to do with with the customer and their experience um or whether it was to do with market effects so at the very least we felt that fintech companies could be relevant if um they either worked on providing a better customer experience um and this may not even be through financial products sometimes a, a company that comes to mind that we worked with called huntos um you could say merely but actually worked on um providing customers with real time responses to problems they had with within financial services now if we think about our work in financial inclusion this is huge because often it's very cost um, it's too expensive to communicate with low income customers real time and often they are left without a lot of financial information so um what we saw was not only related to improved products but often better experience and as some of these fintech scale we may even begin to see new value propositions in financial inclusion so can we really make it possible to provide um receivables finance to a small entrepreneur um selling milk in rural uganda um some of these propositions have tremendous potential to solve financial inclusion challenges um they need not always be directed at a customer for instance um several fintech products that um are b2b or uh, or involve working with um financial institutions may also have an effect particularly if they reach scale um fintech companies can actually expand the use cases for payment accounts they could make it possible for um not just affluent but low income people to transact digitally for a variety of reasons um often times emerging markets may not have the right infrastructure whether it relates to um identifying citizen uh, customers at um at the acquisition stage or perhaps um um underwriting them during um before providing credit and a lot of fintech companies work at this level which is at enhancing better infrastructure um as as some of these companies scale these effects may become real um next slide please once we saw um some of these um kind of overview effects it became very important for us to understand um whether the actual technology or the model uh, that fintechs offered really worked and whether the claim of serving low income people came true if you took a company to market and say served 1000 customers so what we did at cgap was we conducted 18 pilots with um, we conducted pilots with 18 fintech companies and the idea there was to to generate evidence that would help help ideas scale we largely worked with early stage companies um that is companies that hadn't um kind of really scaled in markets but that was intentional and we found that our companies fell into one of five areas um there were companies that were expanding the ability there, there were companies that were making finance more interactive through real time and cheap communications with customers um as many have mentioned there was a lot of payment related activity especially around countries where smartphone penetration is growing however many of these payment com uh, the companies that we worked with um while providing a smartphone payment app still worked on um doing so with low data costs and low storage requirements so to encourage um use cases amongst the poor um a lot of activity then focuses on credit and insurance which is often which are often considered fairly risky products in our in our world and many of the fintech companies we worked with were using technology to either reduce risk or costs of credit and insurance and enhance convenience um so this could be the use of 
um, look, uh, network data or connections data, which we call connections-based finance. So leveraging social and digital connections, often within savings groups or other informal social groups to actually offer, um, to build credit worthiness and offer short-term credit. Or um, another kind of very powerful innovation um, area, which was using satellite or other location-based data to really enhance um, uh, insurance and credit opportunities for smallholder farmers. Um, these five innovation areas, lastly, kind of look using digital features to, to um, enhance flexibility, but also reduce risk within some really risky expenses, whether they are related to health um, or um, energy, which are very important for low-income customers, but often very hard to finance um, within our system. Um, when we stepped out of, of these five innovation areas, we, we quickly realized that this is surely not a comprehensive set. In fact, what we have worked with perhaps represents a very small sliver of what's beginning to happen in the fintech ecosystem. Um, this is this is exciting for all of us as as an industry, but even with maturing models like payments and credit, um, we don't have enough evidence or of of impact whether um, financial services offered by fintechs truly expand the triple A's of of what Miley's mentioned. So we think it's very important as an industry to quickly get to those metrics. However, there are several companies that haven't scaled that are at the early stage. And I think as an industry, what we must ask ourselves is, are we choosing the right solutions? And do we have the right data to, to explain future viability, scale, and impact of some of these early stage companies? And I think the work um, being done here by all of you um, and us would, would help us get there. Um, finally, uh, it's, it's hard to talk about fintech and financial inclusion without talking about the need for patient capital to develop and scale some of these ideas. Um, better information and metrics perhaps will get to some of this more early stage and riskier innovation. And I think the work that Catalyst Fund is doing on this um, is very relevant and, and we um, are collaborating with them on that. I'll finally conclude by saying that the fintech space is very crowded and chaotic, but I think these frameworks that tie us very strongly to impact will help us get to greater impact. So with that, I'll, I'll um, say thank you and hand it back over to Cam Camilla. Great. Thank you so much, Gayatri, and to all the speakers for sharing your frameworks and approach for understanding inclusive fintech. We'd now like to open it up to questions from participants. Um, we've seen a number of great questions coming in over the course of the past 15 minutes, and we'll now turn to those. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, I think, a question, a thematic area that's come up in a couple questions, and one particular question that captures it quite nicely for all panelists. How can fintechs be designed to cater for the poor majority, the majority of whom are illiterate, oftentimes innumerate, under-resourced, and surrounded by poor infrastructure? Not to mention that the state of, current state of consumer protection is inadequate. So it'd be great to hear um, panelists' thoughts on this challenge of designing for a, 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 a difficult to reach audience who is already sort of beyond the reach of traditional financial services. Great. Okay, so just, and that's, first of all, that's a great question, and that one that we always grapple with, and, and the fintech companies that we work with also are constantly grappling with. But I think at the heart of the matter, it's really about trying to design the products from the, from the products and service from the get-go for the population that you're trying to, to reach. I mean, that's the the basis and the sine qua non for offering a service, like whatever service it is, via traditional channel, channel via fintech. But what we've seen in particular is that fintech startups do this via deep and, and lean research at the beginning to really understand what kind of communication channel to reach the customer is most effective. And it, it, at the end of the day, you have to think about what's the value of the product you're providing for the, the segment and also what's scalable, because you don't want to break the bank. And I think there was another question about um, how can you provide, how can you reach customers without very expensive above-the-line marketing, that kind of ties into this as well. So to give an example, 
one of our companies uh, in the insurance space has done a lot of testing by segmenting groups of users where you had groups of users that had, for example, a phone, a feature phone, and were literate. And for those, for instance, SMS explaining the value of the products in the local language, uh, sent at appropriate times where, for example, uh, the community was gathering in the evening or farmers were coming back from, uh, from the field was the most appropriate time. And the message via SMS would work. But then others were on the phone but were illiterate. And so for that segment, what they did was using voice messages recorded in the local language that they would send also as um, a voice note that would, would be played to the users via also uh, community leaders or representatives that would go in the communities uh, and play the messages that explain the features. And for those that were illiterate and didn't own the phone and also enumerate, then weekly group meetings would really work. And so community representatives, representatives would go and they would either play the recorded message in the local language um, or you know, have one of the sales agents of the company engage. And it was also the repeat interaction, the fact that uh, the agent would come back over and over every week uh, that build trust with the community and people started feeling this is a real service and they really care about me uh, because of this combination uh, and real attention for the way I want to receive the service and the way I want to hear about it. So, you know, um, again, there isn't one size fits all solution, I think, um, but it's really, it starts really with design, with customer centric design and uh, with testing. So another example we have is radio shows sometimes work really well and, customer, and, and they are also effective and scalable. But it is, it is really about matching the communication channel to reach the customer segment you're trying to reach, the design of the product, and, and by product I mean the entire solution, also the experience, with what the needs of the customers really are. And testing before scaling, obviously. <laughs> Thanks for those uh, terrific examples, Melis. And someone else has tried to jump in. Yes, yeah, sorry. Camille, is it okay if I just two quick points on that? Um, just I think the one, two things that come to mind what we've been seeing is one, when you're talking about scalability and really understanding a business and what it's good for, uh, to always bear in mind that technology doesn't always have to be the silver bullet to everything. Um, and just because it's a fintech and it's core business and, and you know, DNA is a fintech does not mean that everything and, and has to be fintech, everything has to be technology-based. There is value to the traditional models that are um, just, you know, boots on the ground and understanding of end customer from a face-to-face -face experience. And I think that is just sometimes we may forget when we think about the FinTech model and scaling it, at least initially when we're trying to reach the most vulnerable groups that don't have um, the tools at their disposal to be able to interact with the models we're putting forward, it is there is value in making sure that the human touch is still at the end of that. The second quick point, again, is um, not, also not forgetting to learn from, from models and experiences that, are, that have in the past or are even figuring it out as we go. Um, the, you know, the beauty of the, of the PAYGO uh, model, I think I'm, I'm, I'm constantly fascinated by ability to do last mile distribution and figure out how to reach uh, and figuring out the profitability around that and what does that actually mean to reach these customers who for the first time ever would be receiving a financial service and on the back of that uh, another durable product as as well. So I do think it is worth thinking about those models that we have gone through iterations and cycles of learning um, and trying to capture what we can to, to transfer that elsewhere. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, okay. So let's shift to another question. I think this one is geared uh, potentially both to Gayatri and Michelle. But this is a question about um, thinking about impact with fintechs that have B2B offerings. What is the case for financial inclusion in this instance? Um, yeah, I think I'll take that. Um, uh, Camilla with a good example. Um, so I think, at, at, you know, at the very outset, that seems um, like a stretch. So if a company is selling a product to a bank or, or a big um, mobile network operator, what can be in it for um, low income people? I think it depends entirely on the product, but a good example would be a company like Juntos, um, which uh, is a B2B product aimed at banks and mobile network operators. And what they do is that they use a pretty basic technology like SMS um, and they 
communicate real time with customers um, about questions or complaints that they may have about the product. Um, now, the success or the impact on financial inclusion there um, is, is only to be found if Juntos can demonstrate that their real-time interaction has an effect on how um, that bank's low-income customers then use or engage with those bank products. So I think it's very important, um, not just that companies that serve B2B customers have huge um, revenue and sales with the, B, uh, with the bank, but that they in fact show effect uh, or, or, or impact amongst the customers of that bank. Now, there's challenges there around um, data sharing and metrics that um, I think we still need to solve as an industry. Um, but I think that would be the pathway to impact with products like that. Um, another example of a product I, I um, have worked with is a company called Nala, a payments provider that works with MNOs um, and offers engaging smartphone experiences while using basic USSD technology, so the costs are low. So I think there could be impact in that way. It really depends on innovation by innovation and then tying that innovation to some effect on um, low-income customers' interaction with financial services. I think we must also get to the point of financial health um, that Sarah so um, um, aptly described. Oftentimes, though, early-stage companies are not able to show that impact at the get-go, but they must be set up to do so. So I think that's the B2B linkage. It has to be tied to effect on the end customer at the end. Otherwise, it may not be um, as correctly asked in the question relevant to financial inclusion. Um, yeah, so Camilla, just quickly then, I guess from our perspective, it would be a lot broader than that. Um, and I think it goes back to a previous comment made on having a long-term view of this um, and the idea of being patient as the market and the infrastructure develops. So I think there is absolutely, um, it is imperative to understand what the business model in a B2B um, relationship uh, will enable or will deliver for the end consumer eventually. I think there is also something to be said about having um, a realistic expectation of when that will happen and how that effect will actually manifest, whether it's a cost transfer over time, whether it's an efficiency gain over time, whether it's just trying to make sure that we're building, um, you know, a lot of the foundations for um, crowding in. And I think that's something that's quite uh, an important thing from a CDC perspective is, you know, this we do equally look at this idea of both firms and individuals. And most of the time you will see, um, you know, markets start to flourish when there are, you know, a, a good good chunk of mid-sized businesses that are, that are involved in, in the value chain and the development of that. So crowding them in and making this palatable for them in the initial, in the, in the first phase is quite important because they are also the ones that can carry off the scale for you. Um, so for us, uh, it is obviously about keeping the customer in mind um, in the broader sense, but also being quite realistic about what we are expecting out of the investment we're making in the life we're making it, um, and then and, and kind of building that and being quite clear about its own USB. Great. Thank you for that, Michelle. Um, so I'd like to direct a question to Sarah. Um, and Sarah, this is a, a question around sort of what, if any, do you see as the role of grant or concessional funding in pushing syntax to be more intentional about reaching underserved customer segments from the beginning? Sure, that's uh, a great question, one that we're constantly thinking about as um, grant makers. We committed over $200 million over the last five years towards financial health. And of course, uh, fintechs have played a role in, in how we see the most dramatic change and, and the largest scale of impact. Um, we often find that those early stage companies um, are uh, lacking access to the patient capital that they need to, whether it's um, you know invest in R&D or um, even buy office furniture because um, they're all sitting on uh, chairs with no desks um, in a room. And, and we find that grant capital um, is really catalytic at, at a point in time for a company where they're not yet um, 
you know, ready for institutional investments. So we see it as bridge funding in a sense. Um, you know, arguably at some point then grant funding would not be the most uh, efficient vehicle um, to, to enable growth. Um, and, and that's where we then as grant makers shift our lens to thinking about program related investments, PRIs, or, or um, we also have the ability to, to make social investments as well. So it's kind of a, another way of thinking of our spectrum um, once, once a FinTech uh, gets to that stage of institutional capital. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I think we have time for one remaining question. Um, and I'll open this up to the full, the full group of panelists, the question around impact. So in terms of impact, what do you think is more relevant? First, reaching a large number of low-income people to scale perhaps a smaller proportion of kind of the truly underserved, um, having a trans or second, having a transformational impact on a smaller number of people? I think, um, this is Gayatri from CGAP, um, I think we um, have to look to different actors for, diff for each of those. Um, and I think we can't make a choice as an industry on one being better than the other. Um, and perhaps one can even do both at different stages of their journey. So a FinTech might begin um, with, with having, having an impact on one kind of SME group of customers, but as they scale may expand to the entire SME market of a, of a region or a, of a state or a country. Um, I think often um, FinTech uh, as companies are so clearly tied to their um, expansion and scale that it would be very hard to choose whether one works or the other. Um, since the question around FinTech is so closely tied to viability and scale with the whole investment market. Um, I, I think um, even if there is transformational impact um, as, as a prospect in the beginning, it must be backed up by um, evidence of, of working at scale. So I think it's a, it's a choice that we shouldn't make because there are problems within financial inclusion that are problems of scale and access but there are problems of financial inclusion that are fairly um, focused and targeted, like making um, smallholder farmers viable using satellite data. I think that model is targeted, but it needs the space to be effective. So I would say um, maybe we should not make the choice, but we should perhaps make the distinction. I think it's a good question about the distinction. Yeah, um, thank you, Gertrude. I think that's a great point. Neither. It's not either or necessarily. Um, so maybe one final comment on that question, and then I will pass it back to the Finda Gateway team. Uh, if I may, Camilla, I will. I completely agree with get, what Gayatri said, and it is a very important question. I also think we shouldn't make make it an either or, uh, but it is about a staging. I think the industry is still in the early days of understanding what it means to be really transformational um, in terms of leveraging technology to. Uh, expand access quality and usage of financial services for the underserved. And um, we also need to be careful about how we think about scale. I think the impact that some of these inclusive fintechs, especially early stage ones, are, are having right now is not just having the goal of scaling and disrupting and replacing traditional financial service providers, for example, um, and scaling across borders and everybody's using the same technology. In fact, it's perhaps even more impactful to think about it, about scale in the sense that these innovative ideas and solutions that are more appropriate are having an impact because they can partner with traditional service uh, providers. They can influence them because there can be copycats in other markets. There can be traditional financial service providers that say, well, I want to also integrate that solution. Um, it, it's a healthier way, I think, of, of talking about scale and what, what these models are showing and have the potential to do across markets. Um, and, and that's the conversation that I think our space should be having. What, what is the space for partnerships and what is the space for cooperation and not and, and competition, not competition and disruption necessarily. Um, and that's how some of the ideas and, and the value, I think, of these solutions can really scale as well. 
I just want to make a small point. No, excellent point. And I want to thank the panelists again for sharing with us their frameworks. As you can tell, this is a work in progress. We're really still figuring this out as an industry. And I also want to thank the uh, participants for excellent questions. Um, so, Cinda, team, back over to you. And thank you again for hosting us. Excellent. Thank you very much, Camilla, and all the panelists for sharing your insights on this fascinating topic. Now we'd like to hear from all of the webinar participants to get your feedback. I'm going to open up a poll right now. And if you can please take a brief moment to respond to the poll questions, which should appear on the right hand side of your WebEx window. Um, we also mentioned that we would include the contact information for the panelists at the end in case your question uh, was not answered or you have additional ideas or questions to share. So they are uh, up on the slide at the moment. And I will come back to that slide. I just wanted to mention one more thing, which is what's next? Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the recording from this webinar and the presentations will be available on the FinDev Gateway website within a few days. And we will send a follow-up email with the recording to all of those who registered for the webinar. And please feel free to share this with your network. And finally, we invite you to our next Gateway webinar. The link to the webinar page will appear in your chat box as I am speaking. On February 28th, we will have a webinar on innovative consumer financing for cooking energy access. This webinar will explore various consumer financing approaches for expanding access to clean cooking fuels for household energy, including microfinance, pay as you cook, and digital finance. Once again, a big thank you to all of the presenters and to all of you who joined the webinar for your questions and engagement on the topic. Thank you.